So how's it going, Mac? Don't worry, you're not being filmed or anything. Right. Just act natural. Good, turn up. <laughs> I'm Michael Simrusty, and I'm the executive chef of Providence Restaurant in Los Angeles, California. I think, you know, being in California is, it's a real blessing as a chef. You know, we have the best produce in the world. I, I'm pretty sure of that. We have very close ties to the local markets and we're able to maintain a garden on the, on the rooftop of this restaurant like 365 days a year. There's always something that we can grow out there. This incredible temperate climate that we have is, you know, makes us the salad bowl for the whole nation. So that definitely affects what we do. Sustainability affects our decision making on a day-to-day -day basis in, in many ways. Sourcing sustainably is difficult under the best of conditions. I try my best to adhere to the best science that's available in terms of the sustainability of the species of seafood that we put on the menu. It's becoming an increasingly difficult task to create a menu on a daily basis that could be deemed sustainable. When it comes to wild fish, which is something that we've committed to using, there, there are so many other factors at play and wind and weather are two big ones. That definitely makes things difficult. When we can't get something that we already have on the menu and we're trying to you know, buy more. We just move on to something else that, that I think is suitable for that dish. It's one of those things where I think, especially now, with the state of our fisheries, we all have a role to play in making them better. We have really great purveyors here in Southern California that we've built a kind of like a network of people that we rely on. You know, we have very strong relationships with those people so they know what we're after and they know if like choice A isn't available, they've usually got choice B and choice C and they know that it has to fit into a certain framework for us, it has to be sustainable, and has to be wild caught. It's the proximity to the point of harvest, I think, that makes California such a special place to cook, because you're in tune with all of those little changes that happen at the markets and in the farmer's fields. When a fish has been killed, Igejime style, like these have, just, you know, the first of all, the color of the fish just uh, remains exactly as it was when it came over the rail. Like, this is how this fish looked when it was caught by Eric on Sunday. If you don't kill them Ikijime style, you would lose the majority of this color and the fish would come in, they would look very pale. And this, you know, this brilliant red color that we're seeing it would, for the most part, be gone. But also you can see that fish is like still in rigor mortis. That's not because it's frozen, it's because the fish is in rigor. Just, you know, the fish still has most of its protective slime on it, which, you know, all fish have. You know, like the gills are absolutely perfect. Everything about this fish just screams quality and freshness. And so now what we're gonna do is all these fish will be scaled and then eviscerated, and then we'll hang them in our dry ager for up to 10 days. This is rockfish, the same one that we showed you earlier that's been dry aged for one week. Even though the fish has already been seasoned a bit, I'm still gonna season it a little bit more with my two favorite ingredients, fresh gray sea salt from France, then I'm gonna flip the fish over, and espalette. Now don't put the espalette on the skin, because we're gonna cook this at very high heat in a non-stick made-in skillet. And that is a little bit too hot for the pepper. The pepper would actually scorch, and I don't want that to happen. Now, if you don't have espalette, not a big deal. You can use just cayenne, but a bit more sparingly. You could also use smoked paprika, which is a wonderful thing, or just sweet paprika works too. I'm gonna to get my pan nice and hot. I'm gonna start out with a little bit of oil. You can use any kind of oil that you like. The pan is ready, my fillets are ready, and I have these handy little weights. So you hear the sizzle when I put the fish in there, and the skin immediately wants to curl up, and that's what these are for, because these will coax the fish to kind of lay down flat in our pan. I don't need to have the pan on a very high flame. You probably want to have the heat somewhere around medium. Anything more than that, and it would be a little bit too much heat for the fish, because what we want is to cook the fish slowly until the skin is golden brown and crispy. Now that we have the fish nice and flat, what I like to do is remove the vast majority of the oil. When you're cooking fish at uh, fairly high heat, it can get too hot. And if they get hot, then they give off an acrid kind of flavor. So I like to remove almost all the fat. So I'm gonna check the color and you see like, we're starting to get like a really nice golden brown color on the skin of the fish. But the flesh of the fish, as you can see, is completely still very, very rare. You can start to see a little bit of opaque color happening on the edges of the fillets but the center of the filet and the heart of the filet is still really quite rare, which is what we want. Now we're gonna add just a little touch of butter. You could add a lot if you want. So now what I'm doing is I'm spooning the butter, which is beginning to brown, 
over the fish. And what the hot butter is doing as I baste the fish with it is it's kind of cooking the fish on the second side. Because at this moment, fish has only seen heat from the pan. But the flesh of the fish has not been cooked at all, really. And now the best thing to do is once we have the color that we want on the skin and we've got the degree of doneness that we're looking for is we're gonna transfer the fish to a rack. And just let it rest for 30 seconds, maybe a minute. If you serve the fish exactly as it is right now, the moment you take it out of the pan, it will still be a little bit underdone in the center. If we let the fish rest skin side down, moisture that's in the fish will just sort of like transfer through to the skin and begin to take away the texture that we've developed. We'll turn the filet over and we'll just put this in the thickest part. And if the fish passes through with a, just a slight amount of resistance, you know the fish is cooked to where you want it to be cooked. If you put this into the filet of fish and it stops somewhere in the middle and doesn't go any further, you know that that center portion of the fish is still not cooked through. So now we still have our brown butter in the pan. I'm gonna finish the brown butter with a squeeze of lemon and it should sizzle like that. See how it sizzles? And now we've made one of the simplest and most fundamental sauces that exist in fish cookery. Just brown butter and lemon. For the fish, just to show you how it's, the way it's cooked, I'm gonna take it and just cut one right through the center like this. And we flip it over, you see the fish is like super moist, still like pearly in the center, just done exactly the way we want it to be done. Finish with a little bit more sea salt. And voila, as they say. That is our California Vermilion Rockfish from Captain Eric Hodge prepared in a non-stick skillet from made in with brown butter and lemon. Food was always a big part of my life. You know, like my mom was English, my dad's Italian, big family like so, you know, Sunday dinners were always like a big deal and we didn't eat out a lot. We my mother pretty much cooked at home a lot. My grandfather and I we would fish for pretty much anything and everything. You know, fresh water, there were fish for smallmouth bass and perch there. But if we were fishing on the ocean, we'd go and fish for just pretty much anything. Also, like I had to clean all the fish once at once they were caught. So I learned how to do that when I was pretty young. Um, but he definitely, you know, gave me my first fishing rod, taught me how to fish, and really kind of like set off this passion that's been a part of my life ever since I was five or six years old. And I think when you grow up in a household like that, that values food and values time at the table, I think it's sort of it's a very natural kind of introduction into this life that I'm a part of now. In terms of like the creation of the menu, like dishes are based on obviously the protein, but also whatever the vegetable accompaniments are, and base a dish on something like sweet peas or fava beans or matsutake mushrooms or whatever. They may only be in season for three or four weeks, like at their peak. They're still peas, but they're not peas. You know, they're not like perfect. We talk to the, our guests about, you know, where the fish comes from and, you know, who caught it and what the name of the vessel was and stuff because I feel like, I think it's a tangible connection to something that people might not feel all that connected to. If you go to a supermarket and you buy fish and it's just like a little filet in a styrofoam tray under cellophane, it's like, you know, God knows where that came from. But, it, you know, you're probably accustomed to going to a restaurant and they'll tell you where the chicken who raised, farm raised the chicken, and they'll tell you where the peas came from, or where the eggs came from, or whatever. But how often you go to a restaurant, they tell you where the fish was caught, and who caught it, and what the fisherman's name was, and the name of his boat. And as chefs, I feel like the more information we can give to our guests as to where their food is coming from, the deeper the relationship that you can sort of enter with your guests, the more trust that I think that they place in you, that they, that they understand that you're doing everything you can to source the best ingredients possible. And that, I think it's all part of like sort of telling the story of where our food comes from. So for this dish, we're gonna pan roast these scallops in a uh, stainless made-in skillet. These scallops are from Hokkaido, Japan. They are farm-raised. It's nice and fresh, completely dry, not treated in any way, just shut from their shell. Scallops should feel nice and dry in your hand. When they come to you, they should, if you go to your fishmonger and you see a pan of scallops and there's a bunch of murky liquid that they're sitting in, don't buy them, no good. You soak them in a solution of water with, um, with uh, preserve it, chemicals that preserve them and blanch them all to the same color. And you know, it's, you're really not eating a scallop. You're really not eating um, something that's true and wholesome and delicious. So if you see, if you look real closely, you can see these striations of the muscle of the scallop. And when you have really fresh scallops and you do that, see them tighten up, that's fresh. That's, this is the kind of quality that you need to be cooking all the time. I'm gonna season these with a Malden sea salt. This is a flaky sea salt. And when you season, season is, seasoning is an intentional act. You must be like absolutely focused because that will determine just how well your food is seasoned. Now, we're gonna use trusty espalette the way we did on our rockfish. Then we're gonna flip these guys over 
and we're going to season them again. Scallops have a top side and a bottom side. This is the top side of a scallop right here. Scallops, they have two shells that go like that, and one sits on the sea floor, and one faces the sun. So the one on the top has a larger surface, and the flat side will always be on the left of the scallop. So we want to put just a little film in our skillet, and we don't need it too hot. You can see there's just a little shimmer to the oil and just a faint hint of smoke coming off of it. So I'm gonna add my scallops. You wanna hear that sizzle. That guy put upside down. So if you look really closely, you'll see that right away the scallops start to tighten up. They're nervous. They know it's getting hot and they're uncomfortable. I can smell the sweetness of the scallop. I can hear that they're sizzling in the pan and I can see that they're starting to take on just a little bit of color and that they've firmed up. So now what I wanna do is add a little butter to the skillet and let the butter start to brown. And exactly the same way we basted the uh, rockfish, we're gonna do that with these scallops. First of all, we wanna surround them with that brown butter and then we're gonna just start spooning it over the scallop. You see now how they flatten up and they have this ring around the outside like that? That's the sign of a fresh scallop. They're now nice and firm. And so now I can take them and flip them over. All you need is a spoon in the kitchen. You don't need much else. We have beautiful golden brown color. And now what I wanna do is just baste them quickly because these scallops are nearly done. You just wanna barely bring the heat through them. If you cook them too much, they'll start to get tough and rubbery. But I wish you were here so you could smell this because of the nuttiness, the natural nuttiness of the scallop coupled with the nuttiness from the brown butter is just absolutely, just smells so delicious. And that's how they should look, just like that. Now we gotta take them out and we're gonna put them on a rack so they rest a little bit. Once again, our trusty fish tester. So I put it in a quarter of an inch and I can touch it to my lower lip and see what the temperature is like in the center. And it's warm, so they, we know these scallops are done. Okay. So these are our um, California chanterelles. We're just gonna add some chopped chive to them and stir that through. Just give it a little taste. So what we have here is just the chanterelles cooked in their own juices. A little bit of uh, stock, a little bit of butter, chives, salt, and pepper. These chanterelles are here from here in uh, California, by the way. And then this is that reduction of the jus from the scallops that we were talking about, which is just all of the trim that we take from the scallop. So these are our pan-seared Hokkaido scallop with a chanterelle and a natural jus made with the scallop. At the end of the day, our goal when a diner comes in and and experiences whatever it is that we're doing is that they leave and we've exceeded their expectations and they leave with memories of time spent at the table with people that they love and care for. Hopefully, you know, some people come for business, which is also okay, but ultimately, I think the mission of any restaurant should be to please its guests. And that's like, that's our daily mission. I think, you know, the larger mission is to, for myself personally, to be a good mentor to the cooks that work here, to try to you know, set some sort of an example. We, we try to work sustainably. You know, we source the finest ingredients that we can. You know, unfortunately, we're, we're not trying to create world peace here. We're just trying to make people happy when they come and have dinner. One of my favorite bands, they have, they have a song um, that says, you know, we live on this planet, but it's not ours, essentially. It belongs to the children of our children's kids. And that's absolutely true. What band is that? The Grateful Dead, of course. The, is there another band? 